Let us first pause for prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, in your Son's holy name, humbly, once again, we approach. Lord, Heavenly Father, we should rejoice today, Heavenly Father, that your Son, Jesus Christ, gave his life for us, Heavenly Father. I ask that this uh, study today, you put your words into my mouth, that you open up the hall, all the hearts here today to accept the message that you're delivering, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we just uh, want to thank you for the privilege to be able to come out and worship in freedom. Heavenly Father, an ample supply of the Holy Spirit is needed. Shore me up, Heavenly Father, for I cannot stand on my own. In your Son's name, amen. Today's study is called The Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown. Now, as we, I think we spoke in uh, the study today in Sabbath school that the Adventist message is uh, brought by, we're considered historists. Is that not correct? Many call us hystericalists, do they not? I hope we'll still be friends after this study. <laughs> we just went through the holiday season. Did everybody here enjoy the holiday season? Was it uplifting? I hope it was a blessing. Let's, le let's reason together on what December 25th was, is, or is not, historically speaking, or hysterically speaking. Experience tells me this discussion can stir up a lot of emotions, a lot of turmoil amongst and between people's mindsets. Should we just go along to get along is the question. Jesus and the disciples knew of the winter solstice feast days of Saturnalia and Sol Invictus, which occur around December 25th. And they would have nothing to do with it. Tertullian, if I can get a picture of this fellow, Tertullian was an early Christian author, lived from 155 to 220 AD. He was the first to produce an extensive literal understanding of scripture in Latin. He wrote, On your day of gladness, we Christians neither cover our doorposts with wreaths nor intrude upon the day with lamps. At the call of public festivity, you consider it a proper thing to decorate your house like some new brothel. We are, accused, we are accused of a lower sacrilege because we do not celebrate along with you the holidays. He also said the pagan Romans clad their doorposts with green branching laurels in the Saturnalia. Presents come and go. There are gifts and banquets. Yet Christians should have no acquaintance with the festivals of the pagans. <sighs> That hurts, doesn't it? Most people today tolerate, accept, and know that is not the 25th of December when the Christ child was born, but we still, they still go along to get along. Many quite happily do so. Where, why, and how did this question of deception come about? In the great controversy... Ellen G. White writes on page 382, it was by departure from the Lord and alliance with the heathen that the church became a harlot. Genesis 11 tells us, we're going back in history here, that on the plain of Shinar, Nimrod, grandson of Ham, the corrupted son of Noah, founded the city of Babel, or Babel. This was ancient Babylon which proposed a one language, one world government, did it not? We know the history and the story, and you can read it there, because I'm not going to go through that whole thing. When Nimrod passed his, this is another interesting historical fact, his mother slash wife, Rhea Simiramis, 
And I suppose it being her wish to maintain political control cleverly propositioned the people into believing that Nimrod now possessed the sun, and thus sun worship began. It is believed Nimrod and Semiramis were the models after which were fashioned all the other false gods and goddesses as the people of Babel scattered across the earth. Mithra, Osiris, Horus, Hercules, Bacchus, Adonis, Jupiter, and Tammuz, and other sun gods were supposedly born during what today is called the Christmas season, during the winter solstice. To further establish the sun god's position on earth, Samaramas told that the spirit of Nimrod, and this is clever, the sun god from the sky, because Nimrod now possessed the sun, came down, shadowed, possessed, and impregnated her, and now her son, Tammuz, was Nimrod's reincarnation, thus becoming the son of the sun god on earth. On what day was Tammuz born? Does anybody know? Anybody guess? December 25th. Bingo. December 25th. Sun worship spread rapidly, and by the 3rd century AD, it was firmly entrenched in Roman symbolism, astrology, and Roman law. There is a Roman plaque that depicts Nimrod as a winged creature, right there, depicting him as a winged creature, holding what? A reindeer in his right arm and an evergreen tree in his left hand. Hmm. Interesting. So strong was the belief in the invincible sun, or Sol Invictus, Constantine himself, as sun cult devotee, found it perfectly compatible with his pro-Christian sympathies. Constantine, too, found it politically prudent to change the traditional Christian celebration of Christ's birth from January 6th to December 26th to combat the pagan sun god's popularity and marriage the two celebrations into one. And in the early church, this bringing together with worldly views brought more people through the church doors. Think about that. Does this sound familiar as to what is happening today? Are we not compromising? These modern day church alliances are spoke of in Revelation 17, 4 to 5. 17, 4 to 5. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The woman, which is the great city, called Babylon, symbolizes the fallen apostate churches. This was written by James White in 1851. Ezekiel 8, 14 to 16. He tells us of so many abominations that has been and is being adopted by the church. But here in these verses, and I will paraphrase, he saw women weeping for Tammuz, the son supposedly of Nimrod. He saw men with their backs turned against, turned against what? The temple of the Lord. And their faces were looking where? Towards the east, towards the rising sun. Today, the symbolic abomination continues as is in state, uh, which is stated in 17.4. This false teaching of sun worship continues through and by our worldly activities and festivities. How badly the story of Christ has been counterfeited and is leading us astray. We must be careful. Can you imagine something? How about celebrating your dear wife or husband's birthday on the birthday 
of your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend's birthday? Think they would become upset? Hmm? Oops, you will say. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. I, I, I just got a little confused. Just a little confused. Do you think they would buy that? Don't you believe it? Neither does God. He doesn't buy it either. Back in ancient times, as the days got shorter and seasons changed, people thought the earth might be dying as the sky darkened earlier and earlier. So this also helped bring about the feast day of Sol Invictus, the invincible sun. Bishop Liberius in 354 AD ordered that all Christians, and at that time, Christians were considered an outlaw band. We're, we were outlaws because we were Christians. And we were considered outlaws within the eyes of the Roman Empire. So the bishop deemed that by make, mixing the two, Christians could celebrate their conviction beside their Roman neighbors un, unhindered and unpersecuted. That sounds like a plan. But however, and I'm just going to go back here, Ben Franklin stated politically, and I will paraphrase, anyone who gives up freedom for security deserves neither. Ben Franklin wanted us to stand on our feet and proclaim what we are. Shouldn't we stand on our feet, proclaim what, who we are, and what we represent? When was Jesus born? Here stated, and this is, I'm going to state as I understand it to be within five points. And you can please take your Bibles and study this, okay? Don't, just don't think I'm just spewing all this message forth. You need to check it out, okay? Zacharias, who was John the Baptist's father, was a priest of the course of Abijah. See, and he served his three months tenure around June. This is during the days of King Herod of Judea. He served his course around June. Luke 1, 5 to 8. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. Okay, what did I just say? During the days of King Herod, he was the priest of the course of Abigail serving his three months tenure during around June. Now Elizabeth conceived after Zacharias completed his course, Luke 1, 23 to 25. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his minister, ministration were done, that's his course, were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after these those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying... Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Now, point three, that was point two. Point three, Mary conceived in the sixth month of Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's pregnancy, which would make it fall around January, Luke 1, 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay? Point four. After nine months, what would have happened? What happens if you get pregnant nine months later? Huh? And who would that have been? Jesus. Jesus. 
Nine months later, that would have happened. Jesus was born around September or October during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Why is the Feast of the Tabernacles so important, you might wonder? It is a feast rejoicing the deliverance from bondage. Does that apply to us today? Absolutely. And the feast days last eight days. And later you will see this significance. Leviticus 23, 34 to 36. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. Number Point number five. Because of the Feast of Tabernacles... All the inns were full because Bethlehem was not but five miles from Jerusalem. And this being an important Jewish holiday, there would be no room at any, anywhere or at any inns, so necessity brought about a need. The cradle was a manger of hay. I tell you, it's amazing how the Bible puts all things together. If you simply look, you just got to study. Now let's say, let's say if you were one of these shepherds and you're out there in the fields, right? You cert- it certainly wouldn't be any time when it was cold. You have all your flocks, you're sitting there. And if you were a shepherd, I tell you, I know what I saw. The heavens lit up above as we camped out on that hill. It was warm. It was a normal fall night. Suddenly, that bright light appeared. We didn't know what was going on. We had no clue. As we looked closer, there were angels in the heavens. And I know this sounds crazy. You might think I'm hysterical. But there they were. And their brightness lit up the whole plain before us. We were terrified, but you know what? The sheep were quiet. They didn't make a sound. But our hearts were pounding at this spectacle. I thought we'd be chasing those sheep all the way back to Jerusalem. Suddenly there appeared an angel up close, and you know what was said to us plain and simple? Fear not. And when the angel said this, an even greater light shone above us in the heavens. And this one angel continued to speak directly to us. And said, For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And you know what happened? The heavenly hosts sang out, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. That angel told us where we could find the miracle that had come to pass. It was to be in the city of David, Bethlehem. So we made haste and quickly went there to see. And you know what? It's true. I tell you, praise God, it's true. It is a miracle the Christ child is born this day. Amen. And guess what? It's not December 25th. It's sometime in October but there's a reason we don't know the exact day. Study it. Luke 2.21, it's quiz time. Remember the eight days we spoke of earlier? Remember that, the eight days? Huh? 
Why is this significant? This Feast of Tabernacles lasts how long? Eight days. Don't listen to me, though, okay? You just got to read the Bible. You got to hear the truth. Eight days went by, and it was time for the circumcision of the child who was named Jesus, which was named by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Remember in Luke 1.31, the angel Gabriel sought out Mary to tell her, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Luke 25 to 34, and this is long, I know. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Next. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, which was what? After eight days? They took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Who is Jesus supposed to light? Be a light to us and the glory of thy people Israel also, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. 34, and Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall. Remember this, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. This is important because this is a prophecy. This is a prophecy. Simeon's prophecy in verse 34 was written out in Romans 9, 31 to 32 by Paul. But Israel, which followed only after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith through Jesus Christ, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Be be careful. Do not become litigators. Do not become a litigator. Now there was another at this point in time who was very interested in the arrival of the blessed Savior. In fact, he was the one who preached the first sermon to Eve in the Garden of Eden titled, Surely You Shall Not Die. That was the first sermon. Surely you shall not die. That's in Genesis 3, 4. Now this new arrival, I would suppose Satan was pondering. Satan reminisced concerning what God had told the two naked humans and himself there in the garden. And Satan believed, you can't trust these humans. You can't trust them because they passed the buck on to me. You see, Adam threw Eve under the bus, and then beautiful Eve tossed me, Satan, to the curb. It was that woman, Adam said. It was that serpent, said Eve. See, you can't trust humans. God said to Satan in Genesis 3, 14, 15, and I will paraphrase, And because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all things, and ye shall crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I believe the devil was probably thinking all these years, I have been pretty much going here and there across the world, causing calamity, and now this happens. I am going to keep a close eye on this situation. Hmm. What about that great paranoid King Herod? 
Maybe I could use him. This, these are some excerpts from Review and Herald from E.G. White in uh, October 29, 1885 and April 2, 1901. You can imagine Satan is filled with frenzy. The heavenly heralds announcing the arrival of Jesus aroused, aroused all the wrath of the church of Lucifer. You can be sure that he followed the steps of those who had charge of the infant Jesus. He heard the prophecy of Simeon in the temple courts who had long been waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Ghost was there upon Simeon, and he came by the Spirit into the temple, taking the infant Savior in his arms. He had blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thou salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Satan was wroth with anger, because now he saw by and through this aging priest that he, Simeon, recognized the divinity of Christ. Satan was thinking, oh my, what to do? Oh yes, here comes those nosy interfering magi. They're approaching with gifts. They are going to see King Herod too. And I will play on King Herod's insecurities and I'll put the fear of a rival Jew come to challenge his power in his mind. And the magi, they can lead good old Herod right to that child because they're searching him out. But what happened? Didn't work, did it? Nope. So Jesus was saved and went to Egypt and came back after King Herod the Great passed away. Jesus as a child knew his place and what he was all about, Luke 2.40. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2, 41 to 45, and let's go there. And in 46, what does it say? How many days did they search for Christ? How is this significant? Non, not one act or verse in the life of Christ is unimportant. Every event of his life was for the benefit of his followers in future time. This seemingly small circumstance of Christ you know, staying there in Jerusalem teaches us an important lesson to those who should believe on him. Christ knew the hearts of those immediate to him. As those in his company began to group and prepare to return to their homes, there would be much talking and visiting, which, no, which would not be seasoned with piety, grace, and humility. Thoughts of the Messiah and his mission would be placed in the background and nearly forgotten, like a wayward child gone lost. They wouldn't be paying any attention. They'd be happy just to get out of there and go home, right? The parents, Mary and Joseph, sorrowed and searched for Jesus three days. During his relationship with his parents throughout the years, study of the scriptures would reveal their child's mission and the significant interest and intent of Jesus' life. When he should be slain for the sins of the world, he would be separated from them, lost to them for three days. But after that, he would reveal himself to them and be found of them, and their faith rely upon him as the redeemer of the fallen race, the advocate with the Father in their behalf. That's from Ellen G. White, Spirit of Prophecy, pages 35 and 38. Luke 2, 49 to 50. And he said to his parents, after they found him, and he said, How is it that ye sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spoke to them. 51 states that Jesus returned with his parents to Nazareth, and was subject to them and his mother. Mary kept all Jesus' sayings where? In her heart. Where do we need to keep his word? 
as we should too keep in our hearts today, because it is the Lord's request, give me your heart. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me your heart. Let thine eyes observe my ways. Luke 2, 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Christ did not enter into public ministry for 18 years after that. But he was in constant ministry to other, others. He was improving at every opportunity the lives of others. His mother could not but mark his words, his spirit, his willing obedience to all her requirements. Youth Instruction, September 8, 1898, Ellen G. White. The crux of the cross is everything. My most important part to all things Jesus is the Garden of Gethsemane. Why do you think that? It is the decision for completion of his ministry. This all culminated in Gethsemane. All through Christ's ministry, he was on track. God made flesh who came to earth to balance the scales of justice. Sin or not to sin, that is the question. It is a problem we are faced with that we cannot qualify or quantify on our own. Only by faith in Jesus can we turn our life around. So here is Jesus, and I will ask you to attempt to put yourself in his place. I know that is nearly impossible, but think about this. From the beginning, Jesus volunteered willingly to come down here. This celestial deity made flesh. God made him into man. Christ took on all the possibilities of human good, all the bad attributes and feelings, hate, love, violence, jealousy, sadness, happiness, honesty, integrity, courage, self-awareness. He took all this, everything that we feel, he took all this upon himself. He was able to sense everything. Now let's say you compound that, and I mean really multiply those feelings from alpha to omega, from the beginning to the end. Jesus could see it all. He could see everything. Let's go Bible for another moment. Nathaniel and John 147 is another proof positive, okay, that Christ could see the future, that he could feel everything. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and saith, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence Thou, whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. How about the woman at the well? And after her conversation with Jesus, she heads, running into town and proclaims, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? Whoa, watch out now. All the things that ever I did. All the things ever I did. Think about that. You, you, everyone in this room. Do you not think that God knows? All the things ever I did. Matthew 26, 36 to 56. 
It all tells of guard the garden story. We must understand that at this point and always, Jesus had a choice. He was at the pinnacle of his success, if you will. And it was decision time. The game was on. He entered at the garden and took with him three disciples, whom he told to wait there and watch, be watchful, and pray. Jesus at this point was sorrowed and felt heavy in his heart. Satan at this point wanted to crush Christ. He didn't just want this to go on. He wanted this to end. Jesus saw the grievousness of the character of the world and needed to be alone. The hosts of darkness were there mingling within the shadows, wanting to make the sins of this world appear intensive, deep, and as horrible as possible. Because why? Jesus could see it all. Jesus was feeling it all. The pressure, the sins of the world, everything that happened, and what would happen, were now upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Christ moved further into the garden and fell on his face, and he said, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Three times Jesus went back to the disciples. Three times they were doing what? Sleeping. And three times Jesus prayed, the same prayer. Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. The passion of Christ was to complete his mission, and this is awesome. He could see back through the ages and the calamity that sin caused and mankind's future. He felt every heartbreak. He felt every heinous act he saw portrayed out in real time. He felt the loss in every mother's worst nightmare, the backbreaking labor that is man's plight. The hairs on the back of Jesus' neck bristled. The blood of humanity mingled with his sweat were swallowed by the earth of Gethsemane. Christ stood steadfast, ready to complete his earthly finality. Jesus has a promise to return. John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. Jesus exercised the authority of God. His commands and decisions were supported by the sovereignty of the eternal throne. The glory of the Father was revealed in the Son. Christ made manifest the character of the Father. He was so perfectly connected with God, so completely embraced in his encircling light, that he who had seen the Son had seen the Father. His voice was as the voice of God. That's Ellen G. White, MS 41, 1897. Hebrews 2.9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angel for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The crown. You know, we all want to be in that number when the roll is called up yonder. Do we not? We all want to be in that number. 2 Timothy 4. Paul tells us of the reward that awaits the faithful. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a what? Crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I want that crown. I want to be able to take it off and I want to throw it at Jesus' feet and thank him for what he has done for me, right? 
We all want that. Revelation 14, 14 tells us what John saw in a vision. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon that cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a what? Golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And what does he want to do with that sickle? Hmm? Kill you? He wants to harvest you. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. We want to be a part of God's denominated people, those who on this earth have been loyal, those who have kept the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, those of us who have owned the crucified one as their Savior. Those people will receive what? A crown. Jesus came into this world and gave his all on our behalf. The gift is free. All we must do is unwrap that package, accept his grace and mercy, and by faith believe on him who first loved us as sinners. In conclusion today, I want us to read from Philippians in which Paul ultimately depicts in a nutshell the divinity of Jesus Christ and the culmination of his ministry. And I will add because we want to be followers, because we consider ourselves to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, how can we be any less for him? The supreme pattern of humility. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee, sh every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. I hope that today's study has added a blessing to your Sabbath. Amen. Let's pause, pause for a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. In our hearts, we crown Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord of all, all that we do, Heavenly Father, we need to take in his name. We need to walk his walk, Heavenly Father. We need to live a humble life, Heavenly Father, and serve others, Heavenly Father, for that's what Jesus did. We thank you for the privilege, Heavenly Father. We thank you. In your son's holy name, amen.